Okay, now we're going to look at, in the next uh, 35, 40 minutes, how antidepressants affect the long-term course of depression. And as we begin, and it's nice that this is the Hippocratic Institute, <laughs> is when we begin that thought, how do drugs, how does a drug treatment affect long-term outcomes? You've got to go back to the Hippocratic Oath. Because what is Hippocrates saying? What does he say? He says, do no harm, right? What does that mean? Someone tell me, what does that mean? Don't make your patients worse, right? That's how it's usually assumed to mean. Don't make your patients worse. So they come in at a certain level. Don't give them a treatment that makes them worse, you know, five months later. It's actually much more subtle than that. What Hippocrates was saying, we in nature often have a natural capacity to recover from an illness, say depression or whatever, and your treatment in order to not do harm has to improve on that natural capacity to recover. So imagine this just to understand this a bit better. Imagine you have a disease. People come in at a certain baseline of the symptoms. You give them a treatment, 50% are cured, and 50% stay the same. Their symptoms stay exactly the same. No one gets worse. But you cured 50% of your people with your treatment. Have you met your Hippocratic Oath? No. Well, you're good. Most people go, yeah, you did it. 50% are cured. No one got worse. No, the point is, imagine in nature if 70% are cured or 80% are cured. Your treatment has knocked down the cure rate from 80% to 50%. So even as the doctor who's given the treatment is going, like, I have a treatment that cures 50% of people. Until you know the natural recovery rate, you can't assess the merits of your therapies. And our normal method of testing for the efficacy of drugs doesn't touch this at all over the long term. We just have these things, six-week trials. You take it against a placebo. And if it's a little better than placebo, over the short term, we say it's effective. Six weeks has nothing to do with long-term outcomes. So what we're going to do in the rest of this session is just look at what is, how antidepressants affect the long-term course of depression. Like I said, tomorrow we'll do a couple others. So what do we have to do? The first thing we have to do is figure out what's the natural course of depression. What were scientists or researchers saying? What was the course of depression prior to the arrival of the antidepressants? And by the way, these are studies of people hospitalized for depression. These are seriously depressed patients. These are not people walking around in the community, these studies. So what do we find out? First of all, depression at this time was seen as mostly a disease, a disorder of the middle-aged and elderly. Do you know what 20-year-olds got back in the 1950s? They became anxious. Depression was a different thing. It, was, it basically was middle-aged and up. What was the prevalence of depression prior to the arrival of the drugs? Fewer than 1 in 1,000 suffered a depressive episode, seen as really a clinical episode each year. You'll see that very few people were actually hospitalized for it in uh, 1955, only 7,000 first admissions. And here's the course of medicated depression, both short-term and then long-term. What they found in these hospitalized cohorts is that after 10 months, these are very depressed patients that 80, 85% would be discharged and the depression would have lifted within 10 months. And it would lift, basically, there'd be a certain percentage lift in one month and then two months and then three months and four months. And anyway, by the end of 10 months, it'd be about 80, 85%. And they would recover to what is known as euthymia, an absence of depression, not even low level. It would have passed. These are, the, these are comments by the leading depression experts in the country in the 1960s who know that data. And you'll see what they said. We can expect recovery. Most depressions are self-limited. Regardless of what one does, the patient eventually will begin to get better. Now, this is the head of the depression section at the NIMH. Most episodes will run their course and terminate with virtually complete recovery without specific intervention. Because of this understanding of depression, the idea was we'll use antidepressants to speed up a natural recovery process. That was the thought with the antidepressants when they're introduced. How about long-term outcomes in the pre-antidepressant era? You'll see studies like this. And again, this is hospitalized patients. You follow people. They've been hospitalized. They get discharged. Now you follow them for 15, 20 years. You'll find that about half of those patients never had another episode that required rehospitalization. And again, this is a very depressed cohort. 
about 30% over a course of 13, 15 years might have two to three episodes that required hospitalization. And you'll see data that says they'd have an episode, they'd be fine for about three, four years, have another episode. So they'd have these long periods of euthymia. And you'll see and there's about 20% of the hospitalized cohort that became chronically ill. Remember that figure, about 20%, okay? This is the view of depression in the pre-antidepressant era. This is the leading researcher on the long-term course of depression. He writes in 1969, insurance can be given to a patient and to his family that subsequent episodes of illness after a first mania or the first depression will not tend toward a more chronic course. So the understanding is it's an episodic course, all right? Now let's move into the antidepressant era. That's just concluding what I just said. Clinicians, they start using these antidepressants in the 1960s. And here's, if you go back to what they say, you start seeing this odd thing. My patients are getting better faster, but boy, are they relapsing a lot more back into depression than they used to. So right away with the introduction of these drugs, you see this worry arise that there might be a paradoxical long-term effect, that drugs, in fact, that help people the depression um, lift faster somehow might predispose people to relapsing back into depression more frequently than before. And you'll see here, here's the two sort of comments picked about this. Now we get someone to test this chronicity worry. This is 1973. It's a Dutch psychiatrist. He has data for people treated with an antidepressant, people in a matched cohort for people treated without an antidepressant. And what does he find? At the end, I think this is a 10-year study. And he finds that it looks like antidepressants, quote, exert a paradoxical effect on the recurrent nature of the vital depression. In other words, this therapeutic approach was associated with an increase in recurrent rate, more relapses, and a decrease in cycle duration. That means the depressive episodes are coming more frequently. There's less time in euthymia. And then he said, should this increase be regarded as an untoward long-term side effect of treatment with tricyclic antidepressants? My point is here, we're going to follow this story of science from the beginning as it comes in. So we've got a couple points now. Clinical perceptions and the first test of this worry that maybe it's increasing the chronicity. So now they do a lot of studies looking at how fast people relapse after recovery from a depressive episode. And by 1997, Harvard researchers, they have a lot of studies that have studied this. And remember before, it used to be about 15 years before 50% would relapse. Now, it's 50% relapse within 14 months. So you see the shortening of that period in this data? And there's also something like this. They note the longer the patient is on the drug, the more they're likely to have frequent relapses as they come off. So now let's look. We're just gonna go, I'm going to go through all the research I can find that bears on this question, OK? So the NIMH does a trial in the 1980s, and it, it randomizes people to four arms. There's two forms of psychotherapy without drug. There's a tricyclic, and then there's placebo. This is the 16-week results. What do they find? There's actually no difference at the end of 16 weeks before the four groups, except among the very severely depressed. That's where you see some benefit at 16 weeks for the drug-treated patients. Then they do a follow-up, 18-month results. Actually, these results aren't even good for the psychotherapy patients, but what they find is the stay well rate is highest for psychotherapy, lowest for the drug-treated group. And then they did a further analysis. If you look at dropouts, et cetera, the results look even worse. Patients receiving the antidepressant were most likely to seek treatment following termination, produced the highest possibility of relapse probability, and exhibited the fewest weeks of reduced or minimal symptoms during the follow-up period. So in this big study in the 1980s, they saw most chronicity in the drug-treated patients. Now, imagine you're a scientist and, or someone who's an expert in mood disorders in the 1980s, and you went to school in the 1960s. You were taught that depression is an, an episodic a, a problem. Now you've got data showing it's a chronic problem. So in 1985, the NIMH convenes a meeting on this very question. What's going on? What is the course of mood disorders? And here's what they say. Watch what they say here, because this is really revealing. Improved approaches to the description and classification of mood disorders and new studies have demonstrated the recurrence and chronic nature of these illnesses and an extent to which they represent a continual source of distress and dysfunction. You see what's going on here? They're saying we have these new studies. 
They're showing it's run a chronic course, but they're not blaming it on the drug. They're saying those old studies were flawed and we finally found the true course of depression. But what's the difference? This is the course of medicated depression that they're seeing today. They're not seeing the old course of unmedicated depression, but they're saying this is an advance in science. I just want to show here, this is from the 1999 textbook, that you see within the field this recognition that their conception of depression has changed in the modern antidepressant era. It went from episodic, you see this, most patients would eventually recover. Now we have these studies that have disproved this, shown that depression is a highly recurrent and pernicious disorder. So you see in their own minds, they've reconceived of what is the course of depression. Now this study, the STAR-D trial, is the largest antidepressant trial ever conducted. It was funded by the NIMH, 4,041 patients. It was conducted in real world patients. And I will tell you the results were so bad they fabricated the results and there's a whistleblower lawsuit. It's one of the things we write about in um, psychiatry under the influence. They announced, just so you know, they announced that 67% of patients, there was no placebo in this group. The way the study was designed, you were put on a drug. If you didn't get out well with the first drug, you could get a second drug. If you didn't get well on the second drug, you could try a third and then a fourth. You got four tries. And what they announced was that 67% of people eventually remitted. It's just not true. If you actually look about remission according to the protocol criteria, only 38% ever remitted. And we go through in the book about all the machinations of how they violated the criteria to up that announced rate. But here's the key on this. This study, if you go to the protocol, it said this study will guide clinical care in the United States because this is in real world patients. It's not in, what happens is in so many of the FDA studies, they, they only allow certain types of patients in. Those studies really don't tell us about real world patients. This is going to do it. And they said, we're going to have two parts to this study. We're going to show that if you keep trying, you can find a drug that works, and then people will stay well. The whole point is that this will show that people will stay well. They paid people to stay in the trial. They could adjust the dosages. It was real world care. Now, if you go to the study and they announce the one year results, you almost, you just can't make sense of it. Okay? You just can't. You look at it, you know some data is presented, but you can't make sense of it. You know why you can't make sense of it? No, because the study results were horrific. Out of 4,041 patients who entered that study and got four, you know, had this best clinical care possible, there were only 108 who remitted, means their depression went away, and stayed well and in the trial to the end of one year. And by the way, the next speaker, Irving Kirsch, is one of the people who's done some of the analysis of this data. So the real stay well rate was less than 3%. That's the worst outcome I've ever seen from any study of depression ever. So you can see that this is consistent with the idea that regular treatment, in fact, increases the chronicity of the disorder and may be inducing, in many people, a low-level chronically depressed state. This was another such study, real-world patients. It's much smaller. In this study, only 26% responded to antidepressants. Only half who responded stayed better. Only 6% remitted and were well at the end of one year. So these are two, the only two studies I know about in real world patients in modern times, both found very poor stay well rates at the end of one year. Even he's surprised by this. This was a study in Minnesota. They looked at all their patients in, on, on HMOs that had a, a diagnosis of depression or dysmia at the, at the beginning of 2009 then looked at how those patients were doing at the end of the year, and you'll see that basically everyone, still, except for 1,131, were still depressed at the end of the year. You're seeing a lot of chronic depression in this data. This is now just what I'm saying, what you hear, this is what the, the, the profession itself says now. One third of unibolar patients are non-responders to antidepressants. You put them on, they go on to a chronic course. Another third are partial responders. In other words, their depression goes down severely when you go on the drug. They will seen as being helped by the FDA. Okay, but they don't stay well. You'll see what they say. Resolution uh, appears to be the first step of a more severe relapsing and chronic future course. This is when they don't completely remit. Now about a third do remit. At least is, and this is what they're saying, a third remit on the drug, and about half those stay well. I don't even know where they're getting the half stay well, but even by their own admission, 
They're saying only 15% of people with unipolar depression experience a single bout of the illness, and for the remaining 85%, remissions become less complete and new recurrences develop with less provocation. Psychiatry is telling you that with their pills, it runs a chronic course, right? That's what you're saying. This is not me. This is not critics. This is their own data. 